It is Wednesday at 1.30 Eastern. You know what that means. It's time for another One Soccer Hangout. Today on the program, Terry Dunfield, former international coach, One Soccer FC player extraordinaire, and all-around good guy, not to mention he does some broadcasting on the side. Joining the program, Terry Dunfield, Kurt Larson, Oliver Platt. I'm Adam Jenkins. Great to have you all along with us today. Terry, how on earth are you doing? It's been a while since we've had the chance to see each other, to catch up. How, uh, how were things in quarantine? Where were you when you got locked down? And how have you been keeping your sanity since then? Jeez. Uh, it, it's been uh, it's been interesting times. Uh, it, it probably took me maybe, speaking about myself, a week to kind of get my head around what the next couple months are going to look like. And, and then kind of looked at it as what an opportunity to, to get better, to learn, and... Uh, try to be creative and uh, keep working in, in the, in my environment or with the cards that I've been dealt. Curry, you're shaking your head at the optimism here. I'm guessing you don't uh, agree so with far. that. I, uh, it doesn't really fall in line with the, uh, uh, the direction of these shows recently where Oliver and Platt and I just sit here and shake our heads and, and say we're sick of it. But uh, I wish I had Terry's enthusiasm. <laughs> don't we all? Ollie, how you hold I up? Also, I also know. But, yeah, but. I also, I also, don't forget, I said this a few days ago where I said all those people who for so long had said, oh, I just need some time off so I can get in shape or oh, I just need some time off so I can learn a second language. All those people aren't doing that. Maybe Terry is. Most people are not. <laughs> Ollie, hanging in there, buddy? Yeah, I, I would say I'm exercising a little bit more. Not a whole lot more, but a little bit. So yeah, You're there's, there's an optimistic note. You, you do need to get a little leaner. I not the true. flex, but I did a 26 kilometer bike ride yesterday. Yeah. So well, are we, you? Should, you're we should go biking. 6'2", 150, is that what you are? <laughs> a little heavier. Okay. Okay, gentlemen, we'll start the show off today with a little bit of news and, and sort of get our thoughts on what's going on across the pond. Europe seems to be pretty divided right now. Some countries are ready to rock and roll, try and get back to play. Other countries like the Netherlands are, and France now are saying, no, that's it for us. So what, um, what are these announcements of cancellations or we're going to try and make it work doing for our confidence on what things might look like in North American football. Terry, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, I guess my gut thought was uh, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel now. And um, so, so that's positive. I, I think each sort of part of the world needs to, to look at, at their circumstances. I think there's been positive news starting to come out about the virus. Uh, I read an interesting report out of Stanford where the death rate maybe isn't as crazy as what we first thought. And um, that percentage is, is, is maybe going down a little bit. So it's, um, th there's lots of positivity, but at the end of the day, I still think you, you need to respect what's going on and follow protocols and, and, and really look at what's going on in, in our province. I don't know what to make of this right now. You have, you have, you know, France canceling the season. Uh, you have Germany and, and the premiership trying to get back. You have experts in the States saying, well, maybe major league baseball can work, but then you have the, the, the lead doctors down there in the Trump administration saying it looks like some sports are going to have to take a year off. It just seems like there's so much information coming from all kinds of angles and all that information seems to be different right now. I'm just, I'm just hoping that 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 first league can kind of return, whether it be in, in Korea or China or Germany, and then maybe the dominoes start to fall a little bit when uh, uh, and when and when everybody hopefully sees it safe. Yeah, the, the big question for me is how kind of what the Bundesliga and the Premier League and La Liga are doing, how that translates to everyone else, right? Because it's a, it's a different business model. Like those leagues have a massive incentive to try to play because of the TV money involved. Um, for everyone else, you know, there's a bit more kind of a balance between the TV deals versus the ticket money and, and game day money. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how that kind of translates. So there's a very, as I said, there's a very compelling reason for the Premier League, for example, to want to play and to put together a proposal that might be very complicated and very difficult, but is going to get them back on the pitch. Um, you know, whether that's going to be worthwhile for other leagues around the world, I think remains to be seen. But you still have all those partnerships and sponsorships to worry yeah. about. And it's, can you, if you can kick a ball this year, maybe some of that comes back a little bit. And um, uh, TV rights are, are, are one thing, but we saw a story in MLS uh, last month where it was talking about how, this, you know, how much money each club could potentially be out if they don't play this year. So I think it goes a little bit beyond TV 
TV money. But uh, I, mean, I think you're right there, Oliver. Fred, I think you bring up an interesting point that I think the business aspect, not only in football, but in the whole world is, is starting or it's about to really kind of play a role. And, and it, it's crucial. People have to get back to work at some point. Um, but having said that, I think people's safety is most important, not to point out the obvious. And I don't think you want to be the guy that makes the call to start a league and you get it wrong and you're almost starting back from scratch. I, th I think that's always in the back of your mind. And then it's going to depend on what government say as well, right? Like I, I would imagine France might have wanted to play, but the government says no until September and that's that. So what, what can you do, right? Yeah. Every, everyone's circumstances are different, man. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And and speaking of governments and leagues, I mean, you want to be the first one. You want to get the money and you want to get the ball rolling again. But you also don't want to be the league that absolutely flops on this and can like contaminates half the league and have all your players suddenly fall ill. So it's definitely a fine line to walk. I think now, though, Adam, we've got we've got data now. We've got real data now that we can start to go off mm -hmm. that we have five six weeks ago. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you everyone's for the most part is so ready to get out of the house and get back to normalcy. But I don't think anyone wants to face the prospect of what happens if you do go too early, but look how desperate, look how desperate your dog is to get outside. Look at you sitting behind <laughs> me is, right now. This, this is even Spencer, he's desperate he right now. Day. And, the and, cat's staring out the window, the dog's staring out the window. As long as he's quiet, this is, this is good. Bodes well for all of us. Okay. Kurt, we've been doing this show. This is almost episode I, number 40. I think I, Kurt touched on a good point too, is, is, What's, what's your product really going to look like without fans at a neutral site? Do, do you really want to see that product on our broadcast? It's going to put pressure on our broadcast. We've got no fans at games. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to bring our A game. Um, yep. And then it also changes what, like, the, each player is now different. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, he needs to play in front of 30 or 40,000 people. He's a different player mm. playing yep. in it. Need a player who's awesome in training now that gets a little bit nervous under the lights. Maybe mm. he's uh, a, a different type of player now. So there's, there's a interesting. How, how quick can players come back from being off for a, you know a certain amount of time? Where these are uncharted territories we're going through. It's different to NBA lockouts where you still can go to the gym. You can still work on your game. There's there's, there's so much complexity to it. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a great point. The the lead up and some of the coaches and players we've talked to, a lot of them said we would need at least two or three weeks to have some kind of training camp just to feel safe and ready to go. So More. it's a situation we continue to watch, watching the news very closely, which brings us to our next segment. Because we've been doing this now, I think this is show number thirty eight or thirty nine of the Hangouts. We're we're workshopping some new segments to try and keep things fresh and exciting. So this is one that the brain trust behind the Hangouts have come up with. I like to call it "What's Irking Kurt." And I'm going to give the hosting duties over to Kurt. He's going to pick his three favorite or three most compelling, discussable news stories of the day. He's going to take over hosting duties for this segment. And then we're all going to chime in on our thoughts once he gives us his. So, Kurt, here's the figurative hosting baton. Please take it and don't let the show flop. Okay, you left out some important information there and in that we had actually scoured over the social media posts and the YouTube chats and found that people actually wanted to hear from me more, Adam Jenkins. <laughs> Uh, right, so, right, right. That was so, very evident. Uh, so that's uh, why we're. That. So that is actually why you've had to hand the baton over to me, and that's fine. Uh, yeah, I think this is also a, kind of a good way to, to 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 lighten the mood today is just talk about a few of the stories that are floating around out there. The first one, if I can check my notebook here, on what is irking me is I think it was in York Region recently. Uh, a, a mother in a park walking her baby was fined eight hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, in the right area due to uh, coronavirus restrictions. So I'm not going to make you guys comment on that story. I think we had the, uh, I, don't know who, I don't know who it was. It was the, the bylaw officer or something saying that she wasn't, we can all re agree that people shouldn't be fined in parks for standing around. But if you guys have that kind of power to find anybody in society for anything that annoys you, we'll start with Oliver Platt. Oliver Platt, who are you handing out fines to in everyday life? Uh, this one's easy for me. The most annoying thing, I think that and this makes me sound like I live quite a sheltered life, but this might be the most annoying thing in my life. Um, when you're at a busy food court and people sit down and kind of reserve a table before they've actually got their food, that should be an instant fine, in my opinion. 
you're not doing anything. You're taking a table that someone with food could be using. All right. What if you split up though? What if you go, what if, what if I send my wife Sinead to the table and then I go order the food? Yeah, no, that's un unacceptable. Fine. That's okay. What's the monetary value? No, no, no. We're not handing out monetary oh, values. No, no, no. Fine, fine, fine. No, no. Terry, what, who are you finding? What's the, what's, what annoys you? Who are you, who are you handing out fines to? Uh, what grinds on me, it's funny you say that. It happened the other day. People that leave shopping trolleys beside their car and are too lazy to put them back where they oh, yeah. should be in and just drive off and leave the trolley in the parking spot. Because somebody has to go pick it up. Like somebody has to go do it for you then, right? It's just a total jerk maneuver. <laughs> I'll go to my, I'll go to, I'll, I, I'll play off that a little bit. I, I have kind of a pet piece or a, a, I would also find people at grocery stores who leave their carts at the cash register while they're checking out because they forgot something. Yeah. Unac unacceptable in my opinion. I'll go as far now to call people out and be like, dude, really? You're going to leave your cart there? All right. See, I think, I, I think, I think mine should legitimately happen in real life. So what mine is, is. You know, we're so environmentally conscious these days and no one wants to litter. But for some reason, smokers seem to think it's OK for them to throw their butts wherever they want to. You walk up and down the street, they're everywhere. So I would actually hand out fines to anybody I see doing that. So that's mine right there. Adam, before we move on, you got anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of them. I'm a very irritable person sometimes, especially when I was living downtown Toronto. But the one that sticks out to me that's just like the most unnecessarily disrespectful move is when it's raining outside and you have your umbrella out. If you have a golf umbrella, if you could fit five people under this umbrella and you're the only one walking with it, get that off the sidewalk. That's a fine. You just need a little umbrella. Keep yourself dry. If I don't have an umbrella and I'm walking beside you and I'm getting your runoff, unacceptable. No golf umbrellas in the rain. Save them for the golf course. <laughs> Steve McLaren. <laughs> all, right, all right. Well, two more, two more quick ones now before I hand it over to, to Adam. Another news story today that I saw. This one's soccer related. I'll go to Terry first on this one because he's uh, uh, the only professional footballer here. But Ireland, the League of Ireland, is looking to come back. They need permission, obviously, from uh, uh, government agencies and, and the, the association out there. But if you look at the things that they are planning in order to get clearance, it's – I don't even know if it's attainable. First of all, they're going to train in groups of five, which, okay, people are doing that. I get that. But they have to bring their own food and water to the training ground. That starts to get a little bit strange. Uh, they're required to check their temperature before they leave the house. They're required to have the clubs check their temperature when they arrive. And then they have to check their temperature when they get home from training and send in the results. But wait, there's more. Uh, they have to arrive in their gear, change their boots in their car. So it's basically like, like an academy, basically. You're like basically an academy player at that point. Uh, they have to take two team buses to away games, shower one, one at a time after games. And there's my favorite, Terry. They have to sterilize the goalposts after training. Right. Is this even possible? Wipe. Is this even That's possible? It's like playing in the football league. <laughs> <laughs> so my, so honestly, my thinking on this is, are they just trying to just kind of put as much stuff in there as possible just so they can kind of get the approval? Because we know a lot of that stuff's not going to happen. I don't think it's too crazy. The only thing you're missing is wash your own kit. Yeah, uh, that, that was the one that stuck up to me too. Uh, I mean, I, I read a, an article saying that medicals before a game are going to be done in cars. And then if you're good to go and your temperature is right, you can now go into the stadium. Uh, I don't think that sounds too crazy. Uh, I, I like the ingenuity of, of trying to find a way. Uh, I don't want to be the parking attendant to uphold all that. <laughs> There's a fair bit going on. But uh, I think those are the types of protocols that it's going to take for, for, for the game to go ahead. Ali, yeah. you got anything to, Ali, you got anything on that? Well, on it, like I'm with Terry, it, it sounds like a lot when you read it out like that, but like, I wouldn't expect Cristiano Ronaldo to sign up, but League of Ireland, I think they can deal with putting their boots on in the car. Like, Sure. It's not, it's not that it's not possible. I just, I just think it's more of a thing where they're just trying to get it through, right? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think clubs are going to be able to maintain that standard throughout, so mm. that's my thing. Let's move on to the last one. Um, Major League Baseball trying to come back. Uh, they've, they've announced a, a, a plan to potentially, or 
there are reports of a plan to potentially play behind closed doors. That's nothing new. Um, but they're also looking at kind of rearranging the divisions and actually going to more of a three, three conferences in East, a Central, and a West. And you only play teams in your conference uh, for a 100-game regular season. I'm just wondering how that could translate to Major League Soccer or the CPL, if you guys would uh, – uh, would be interested in seeing something like that in MLS. I think that's a solution for uh, for some of these leagues, Solly. Yeah, um, I, I'd certainly be interested in it if it works. The the big question again, it just comes back to the stuff we were saying before. You know, what's the cost, and and is it worth it? Right, like, a, and and you have to weigh up some of the risks as well. You know, what happens if one player gets sick? Does the whole thing have to be shut down, or are, are there ways you can deal with that? So, um, look if if. if any league can make something like this work, then I'm all for it. But it, it does seem like a lot uh, of kind of risk for, for, I don't know, the potential reward. CPL split into two two divisions, play in East and a West, play all the games in Ottawa, maybe play all the games out West somewhere, maybe in Edmonton and make it work, right? Yeah. If, if you can find places that are willing to, to have them, then for sure. All right, Terry, you got anything to add on that before we throw things back to Adam? I think... The big uh, con to it, Ollie nailed. If if somebody gets sick, uh, then you're then you're in trouble big time. Yeah, I think the data coming back is there's a certain demographic that, um, that 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 obviously struggles with the virus. So um, I think you need to take that into consideration. But what you will see is you'll see teams basically living in hotels at this venue for a long period of time. It'll almost be like. Uh, a world cup in, in countries where certain cities host and um, players are almost living together in, in a village or, or a hotel. Mm-hmm. There you go, Adam, take it away. How'd it feel? Uh, I don't know. I did the same thing last Friday. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm pretty good at it. Do you feel some levity now? You got all that off your chest? Uh, I don't know. Let's get on to the interesting stuff. Terry and his career. That's why we had him on today. Well, he's an interesting guy. I'm not sure if you knew that, Terry, but you're a pretty interesting guy. Thanks, man. We've got this connection on the field when we play, too, don't we? I wanted to talk about it, but they're like, no one else is going to find your world-class golf entertaining, so let's move on from it. But I completely agree with you. Um, However, that was beer league soccer. Unfortunately, I have to remind myself of that. You, on the other hand, have done some pretty cool things in your career. So I want to take you back through your journey a little bit for people who may not know your story all too well, and then we'll get to some more topical conversations and some more pet peeves a little later on in the show. But let's talk about sort of the very beginning of your breakthrough. You're only... 15 years old, all of a sudden you're going to one of the biggest clubs in the world, um, going across the ocean to become a professional footballer. Can you just talk about that transition for you, how you got picked up by Man City and what that year, your couple of years were like with the Man City Academy? Yeah, uh, I think I knew since I was a kid that I was always going to be a professional soccer player. I was going to find a way. Um, I'd had a couple of opportunities to go to Europe uh, a little bit younger uh, and then at 14, I was, I was, I guess, ready, uh, went and trained with Manchester City for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, everything came quite easily to me. Before I knew it, I was playing in the Premier League when I was 18, kind of progressed f- from under 14s, 15s, right up to the first team and uh, went to an incredible academy at Manchester City. And, uh, yeah, I, I think what was next uh, was difficult for me. In that you mentioned it coming sort of relatively easy for you. And I think you have to be able to be at that level when you're a young Canadian making that transition. But I'm sure it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, not to say that that's what you're suggesting. So what would you say were some of the the biggest learning curves or difficulties you experienced at that age with Man City? Uh, Probably one of the toughest things. And and everything happens so quickly uh, when you're playing. You're on to the next game. You're on to whatever it might be that it's difficult when you're, especially when you're a kid to, to sit down and reflect. And uh, I, I think some of the attributes needed off the field, I didn't quite have. I, I was on my own at 18 in Manchester, a ton of money was thrown my way. Um, and probably even worse than that is I thought I was ready. I, I thought I was ready to play week in week out. I kind of thought I knew any, everything, um, and back then you, you're not looked after like a young player right now where you're, there's a real holistic approach and, um, probably 
the first little adversity came when Joe Royal left, Kevin Keegan, a new manager came mm-hmm. in close to three years left on my contract. And uh, I more or less said to him, I'm like, Hey man, I want to play. I'm ready to play. And uh, we had like Al Berkovich, Ali Benarbia, some real world-class internationals now ahead of me that he'd brought in. And he said, look, Terry, just be patient. We'll use you off the bench, maybe send you out on loan. And I went into his office and said, no, I want to go. I want to either play me or I'm going to go sign with the team that I was on loan. And, um, you know, thinking back, I was, it it wasn't probably the best decision. And um, now all of a sudden I'm playing in the football league. Terry, I want to, Take, take you back to something you just said there. Um, you talk about how now players, young players, have more of a holistic approach within clubs. We know that you're uh, one of the academy coaches at Toronto FC right now. Um, so how do you combine what you learned maybe when the approach was much different and some of those things that you thought were quite valuable uh, to pass on to your players while also taking into account the style of coaching youths today, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think um, just like you're not only developing players, you're developing people and, and adversity is going to come and it's going to come to individuals in different ways. And as, as a coach, all we can do is best prepare uh, our kids and, uh, and and sometimes just being patient and, and giving them tools, what they need to, to succeed and succeeding is having a career. It's not just playing a game or two and thinking you've made it having a career is, 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 is making it. And, uh, I think that's what we want to equip our kids, not only at TFC, but all across, uh, academies, uh, in Canada. You mentioned that Terry, that you always thought you would be a professional footballer and you were going to find a way, whatever that took. Is, is that, that, that characteristic is something we talked about a bit on these shows. Is that something that's teachable? Do you think, or does a player just need to have, kind of have it? Yeah, I, I think every player is a little bit different. And, and for coaches, it's getting to really know the personality, the characteristics of, of the players that you're coaching. And, and you're not developing teams in academies. You're developing uh, individuals. And um, I, I really think that's the key. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, then, Terry, moving on to your time with Barry, you mentioned sort of the after Man City part of your career, significant success with Barry, but then you had, and I still grimace every time I think about this, but you broke your kneecap. Tell us about what led to that. And is that the most painful injury you've ever had? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, it's the same thing that happened to Victor Vasquez at Barcelona, dislocated my knee, fractured my patella. And I was out for two and a half years, couple surgeries. And, and I really hit rock bottom and anything that I'd taken for granted, if I did get the opportunity to play again, I'd, uh, never do that again and uh, did whatever it took to, to get back uh, deep down. And, and I, I kid myself a little bit. I knew I'd never be the same player. But for the rest of my career, I, w- I was playing with a handicap, which sucks. You go into every single training session and you know you can only do so much. Your knee's going to be sore. You're playing in the football league. Everyone's battling to, to play on Saturday. You're not treated maybe like Victor Vasquez was. And oh, I'll take it easy through the week train on Friday and play on Saturday. So a lot of the times when I go to play, I was beat up from just the intensity of training. So it was, it was tough, but I I really, by hitting rock bottom, found out who I was reconnected with my values and how I was brought up and uh, never took a a training session for granted, which was also a problem too, because as you, as you see in even the games we play guys, I, I just love playing. I love running around. But it was probably to the detriment of maybe my performances on Saturdays. But it was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful I got another opportunity. Terry, you talked about playing with a handicap, which which would seem to indicate that that, that hurt you, hurt you not only professionally but uh, uh, maybe mentally as well. And then obviously the long term implications. Did you ever any, have any concerns about passing medicals? I mean, how do you get beyond that and convince teams that you're healthy enough to play? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, for the UK guys, you're driving up the M6, you got your medical in your hand, everything was paperwork, it's just out the window. <laughs> and they say, Where, where's your paperwork? <laughs> uh, like every time you run and you, you're assessed, you, you feel like you don't want to hinge to your, like a, you, you show a limp. So you're thinking about your gait when you're running. Um, 
but, but you're just trying to mask that injury. And probably the word I'd use for the rest of my career is I just adapted and, and I found a way to execute whatever the coaches needed. Uh, and, um, you know, you know, like I said, was fortunate enough to, to have a career, but I never played freely. I never was able to really do what, what I saw and, and, and do it consistently as well. I want to talk a little bit about more, a little what? more about, excuse me, the recovery of it. Cause obviously you're still a young man at the beginning of your career when this happens. So walk us through some of the like physical rehab that you would have to do, but also what were some of the techniques and things you would try when you were feeling down in the dumps? Like I'm never going to recover from this. Cause it's, it's a mental and a physical rehab when you have an injury like that. Wow. Great question. So I had uh, initial surgery um, and 18 months later uh, I had so much muscle atrophy. Anytime I'd squat, my knee was sore and I th- kind of thought, right, I'm done here. Um, well, actually I didn't think that I always, I never really gave up hope. Uh, that I get back, but I but I started to take online courses to the Open University. I've got half a law degree. Started to plan a little bit, but but never really gave up the dream of coming back. Actually, came back to Canada. Dr. Bob McCormick, who's an Olympic surgeon for the Canadian ski team, uh, microfractured my knee. Uh, that was a nine month process of of coming back from injury, and, and you're um, you, you're just hoping it'll be enough where I could play again. And as soon as I had that second surgery, you can see light at the end of the tunnel. And that was enough motivation for me. Uh, Manchester city brought me back in did the last six months of my rehab. I ended up playing for my hometown team, Macclesfield, who who was actually coached by my Manchester city coach. It's kind of cool through my whole career. Every single coach I had uh, bar MLS was a connection to Manchester city. Uh, And it, it took 18 months to get a level to a level where somebody would buy me and I was ready to kind of kickstart my career, but it was cool playing for my hometown sort of city in, in uh, Cheshire over in England. Nice to be able to take those small victories too when you can, because you work so hard for that rehab. So to get those moments, I'm sure that meant the world. And as you mentioned, now you're playing with one soccer FC, having the time of your life. So it clearly the rehab worked. Yeah. That's why I keep coming off all the time because my knee's sore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure we're, and, and you kind of just enjoy the little wins, like you say. So one little win is I can now uh, take the brace off. Now I can jog. Now I can go back to the field. And each one of those progressions that I couldn't make in those first 18 months was I'm a little bit closer to, to getting onto the field. Yeah, energizing for sure. I mean, I'm, I don't think we're going to touch a, a fractured and dislocated patella, but Kurt and Ollie, what are the most – gruesome or toughest injuries you've ever had to deal with in your careers or life. Oh, I'll let Ollie go first because if he's going to give the same one he gave in the production meeting, it's, I thought it was pretty small time, but go ahead, Ollie. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I beg to differ it is, uh, sorry to anyone eating their lunch right now, but it's hands down the ingrown toenail I suffered yeah. uh, when I was about 14 years old. Um, don't Google this because it's, it's fairly disgusting, but I, I played through this, tried to play through this while treating it for about a year. And it's just, you're Just a warrior angry. you're such yeah. a such a but, warrior well yeah and you know i battled um but any anyway it ended up in in surgery uh, after about a year of, of trying to fix it and, and failing surgery yeah you, have you, to didn't, have you left thing. you didn't bring that up in the production i feel bad i think you bring that up in the production <laughs> meeting well you have to have the whole thing off right Okay. Okay. Yeah. Did, takes, you're missing. Uh, there's two come to mind. They aren't anywhere near as bad as Terry's, obviously. One, uh, I was actually going up for a 50 50, a header uh, the, uh, in a basically a preseason college game. And uh, my, my head went up and back, and I kind of collided with the, his two front teeth, and his two front teeth sunk into my head. So I had to get uh, three staples in the back of my head where his teeth actually entered my. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, my uh, head. And the one that was a little bit worse than that, it hurt. It certainly hurt worse was I actually got injured my freshman year of NCAA soccer in a warm up game. Um, it's one of those games. I don't know, Terry, if you, if you've played it where it's more of a handball instead of soccer. So you have the ball in your hand, right. And you're just tossing it around. And, um, what happened was this is one of the rare times that the third string goalkeeper can shine in, in training. <laughs> So he decided to take it upon himself, went all went full Michael Vick basically, and started trying to juke people and get around them. Uh, and he tripped over his own feet 
and he basically all of his weight basically just collided with my knee. So he fell, he just fell into my knee and, uh, I was, it was extremely painful. And basically my knee just buckled toward my MCL. I was actually fortunate, uh, that I didn't tear an ACL or, or tear a meniscus as well. So it was just an MCL, but very, very painful. Yeah, I've, I've been there with the ligaments. I've had an LCL and an MCL and a meniscus went out on me. So I, I know that pain. Let us know your injuries too. I'm, I'm, they gross me out, but I'm also really interested. So comment your worst injuries. And if you have any questions for Terry, of course, throw them in the YouTube chat. We'll get to them a little bit later on in the show. Back to your career, Terry. So let's go back to, or let's get to international side. So yeah, you play your first game with Team Canada. Obviously, it's an experience that no one will ever forget. And it's a memory that hopefully lives with you for as long as you are on this earth. But after that cap, um, if I recall reading the story correctly, Stephen Hart, who was coaching at the time, said, if you want to play at a higher level, you have to, and you want to earn more caps for Canada, you have to play more. You have to get into a more prestigious league to get noticed. Um, looking back, do you think that was good advice? Yeah. Um, I, I think there was context to it as well. Uh, no disrespect to Shrewsbury and where I was playing. I, I mean, it's a fantastic club. Uh, but if you look at the regulars in the Canadian men's national team at the time, they were playing – in the Bundesliga, playing in MLS, uh, playing in the Turkish top league, and uh, some in the championship as, as well in England. We might have had, I'm not sure if we had somebody in the Premier League, but if you're realistically going to compete for a spot in the 11, you need to be playing at a, at a certain level, at a certain tier. And uh, it was a bit tricky because Shrewsbury at the time were like the whole, uh, whole city of, of the lower league. They, right. they new stadium, uh, had bought up all the best players in the lower leagues and, and contracts at the time where it was like 2008, like financial, like Northern rock banks were going under. You didn't really want to be without a contract. It's not a year or two. Left. I remember going in and saying, Hey, Paul Simpson, uh, the manager just left that summer and, and going into the, I guess, chairman and owner and said, Hey, look, I'd, I'd like to leave my contract if possible. I've got nothing really lined up uh, up and down career and if I'm going to take one more shot at getting to the highest level possible it's now and um, he said are you crazy dude like what's wrong with you? you you know we've got a vision in place you're a big part of it and I said yeah I, I get that and uh, I actually paid six months of my own contract out to become a free agent uh, which is crazy just with the ambition of playing at the highest level possible. And uh, to put that sort of process in place, uh, fueling the motivation of, of playing for Canada. I'm now an international footballer and uh, was going to try to um, just, just get more of that. that. I just just wanted – that itch wasn't scratched with that one cap. I wanted more of it. And uh, so I'm now training on my own in the park and uh, just waiting for that phone to ring. Uh, Motherwell called. Uh, had a contract in front of me in the SPL, uh, which was wicked. M Motherwell, they were actually playing Manchester City in a qualifier to get into the Europa League like two weeks later, uh, which is kind of everything going full circle. That would have been fun. And then uh, I get an email from Bob Leonard Doozy, and uh, he said, more or less, you know, we might be a good fit. Mm -hmm. All right, before we get, while we're on Canada, I just want to ask Terry this now. It's Terry, at, at, at your top, at your peak, you're an international footballer now. Would you make Canada's squad today, given that the, the midfield's uh, uh, pretty deep at the moment? I think you ask any player that, they're going to say yes. And if, if you don't say yes, then maybe I'd question you why not. Uh, and I get that you... I, yeah, I, I agree with you, by the way. I think there's something to be said for understanding your role in and uh what you bring to the table uh but my personality uh wh whatever i want to do i want to be the best I'm, I'm trying to be the best under 14 coach in the land and um that's my mindset so uh yeah i guess that's what i'd say that so it's a pretty stacked midfield uh, <laughs> i think there's a place for you i'm, I'm, I'm not even uh, i'm not even uh, kidding with you right now one thing I'd, i would have liked to have done is to be 100 percent fit and play in TFC or Canada's midfield right now. That that would have been fun, just just because of how much I love the game. And I've really it's taken me to the end of my career to understand the why. 
and why I kind of did these actions. And, and Greg Vanny, John Herdman, even Nick Nurse and his coaching staff with the Raptors really explaining the game to me and understanding it. I'd, I'd love to be 18 again, but I guess everybody says that. Can you uh, drop in at sense back? Because then you're definitely in. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to be 18 again too, but that wasn't too long ago. I think it's a little overrated. Um, just speaking of advice, speaking of being 18 again, I want to talk about advice to your younger selves. And I'll, I'll ask everyone, but we'll start with Terry based on, I'm sure throughout your career you've given now, especially as a coach and as a former player, received some good advice. But where you are now, going back to being 18, what advice would you give your younger self with everything you know now? Uh, it's not always going to be easy. And when it gets hard, uh, this is your opportunity to show what you're made out of. And, uh, yeah, I think that would be it. When, when it gets tough, uh, you know, I think you see what people are really all about. Are you going to stay as inspirational as that? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, I have two. I'm going to, I'm going to say, uh, don't get those tattoos would be, <laughs> would be the, yeah. the first. What's that Terry? I agree. <laughs> would be the uh, the first advice that I would give uh, a young Kurt. Uh, the other one, uh, the other one is would just be to, to live more in the moment. Uh, and, and I think I think kids are always told that by by adults. Um, but but you know you look back on all the moments, both both playing and just just living, and uh, you would have really liked to enjoy those a little bit more instead of always constantly looking ahead to what's next, which I always tend to do. Even now, I'm always looking ahead to, to what's next. So live in the moment for me. Oliver, our resident uh, psychiatrist and philosopher. Jeez, <laughs> oh, uh, my advice: control the controllables. <laughs> that's it. The most Oliver, the, the most Oliver Platt answer ever. I, just leave I, it at that. That's 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 him. No, I, I heard a football manager say that in like a it's just an ordinary interview when I was like fourteen or fifteen. It kind of stayed with me. I like that one. This is why we're mates. We're like chalk and cheese, and I'm like push the limits. <laughs> I love it. That, I love that, it. Uh, there's your there's your first tattoo, Ollie. Right here. Control yeah. the controllables. Yeah, you, you, can't, uh, you can't control I think Kurt it. knows the guy, so you should be all right. Uh, every day. So, outside of your control is the point. <laughs> so so I got my, every day, every day my wife Sinead, she she uh, she's been great during during this period and she takes the our, our little boy upstairs for a nap and then she watches the show from upstairs and she's always commenting on the most Oliver Platt answer ever. And I guarantee you that's going to be the, the answer from today. <laughs> Sinead's already written it down. Oh, but she loves that. No, she loves it. She loves it. She's like, he's just, he's great for the show because he always, uh, he's the straight guy on the show there. What's up, Sinead? I can't read this. <laughs> yeah, yeah speaking of one, speaking of one soccer FC legends, shout out to Sinead. That's what I'm talking about. Sinead okay, Terry, 2011, we're going to, I guess we're fast forwarding in the past, if, if that makes sense. So we're going a little bit further ahead. 2011, you're traded from, from the Whitecaps to TFC and you go and score, you go against Vancouver, you score against the Whitecaps, 94th minute, seal win, 3-2. Was that the most satisfying goal you have ever scored in your career? Uh, this is going to sound uh, crazy, but at the time, I'm sure Kirk can attest to it covering us, but we were having a nightmare season and, and the three points were actually even cooler than the goal. Is that, uh, that, is that that famous picture of you with the smiley face and celebrating or is that, was that against Houston? Uh, it might've been, but it was, it, it wasn't really until the end of my career where I was like, wow, that was kind of cool. And uh, I did, there wasn't, there's not really time uh, as a footballer or you do lose time to really have regrets and uh, one thing I always tried to do was when I left a club or was bought or sold or kicked out, uh, I was just moved. <laughs> and at, at the end of my career, uh, I've had an opportunity to kind of think back and really enjoy these moments. It's been kind of cool to watch the one soccer games, listen to my broadcast and f figure out ways to maybe make it a little bit better. Or as a player, I never actually watched myself play. And there's been a lot of games on TV and, for the first time ever, I've, I'm going. Oh wow! I, it, it was. It's it's kind of fun watching yourself play because as every player was different. But when we used to go into meetings on a Monday with the team, I used to go in with a huge shield 
And uh, if the manager came for me or I made a mistake, I always had, well, it was his fault. Or I, right. I never had a growth mindset. I only wanted to make sure I was in the team on Saturday and, and never really looked at improving my game. Maybe that was partially because of my knee and I, I knew I was at my ceiling anyway. Uh, but it, I've, I've really enjoyed looking back at, at, and watching myself play. And it was, it's kind of funny, all these, we, we talk about principles in soccer uh, so much about how you teach a game. And one principle might be kind of, I'm having all these aha moments in case you've not noticed, might be playing <laughs> in behind. And to play in behind, a lot of things need to line up. You need to find a player with time and space, probably facing forward. The back line needs to be high, maybe a little bit unbalanced. You need to run and kind of understanding the why to my game, watch it, watching the games now. It's funny, I actually all these principles I did instinctively without really knowing the reason why. Uh, so it's kind of cool. And, and now as a coach, it's kind of finding the right balance of letting players kind of figuring it out on their own, not giving them too much theory and, and just finding the sweet spot where, where players can just play. And I'd say as a player, I was probably too far over at just playing without a real purpose. Um, so that was a really long winded answer to the question, but yeah, I love the goal. <laughs> <laughs> we got to where we wanted to be, uh, talking, moving on a little bit to your commentary career now, and I've had the pleasure of sharing a booth with you. Mind you, it was a little bit last minute, but, um, all of a sudden you and I working together for the first time and it was a pretty amazing experience as we really continued to grow together in the booth. But I want to talk you back to Canada, USA specifically, and obviously that's a big game for Canada soccer for a lot of reasons, but just what do you remember from that match you calling the game with wheels and, and where does that rank in your career highlights throughout soccer? Uh, not to sound too selfless, but that's probably my favorite moment uh, in Canadian soccer, uh, in, including when I used to play. Uh, I came into the game not really knowing what to expect. BMO was so much fun under the lights. And from minute one, Canada had this iron will, this intensity to their game. And they almost, I'd say, bullied the U.S. off the field. And I didn't want the game to end at the end. It was incredible. Uh, and it was just so special uh, to, to play a tiny little role in the broadcast. But it was so cool to see the guys uh, go out and execute like that. And, and now we've just set the bar up here. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get above it again one day. But it was I don't know what you guys think, but it was it was so cool. Terry, I want to I want to follow up there and ask you. I mean, did you? I had never heard you call a game like that. Uh, did you feel like that in the moment that this game was a little bit different than you were even handling it a little bit different? Because I think at the end of the day, it actually was probably the best broadcast I've ever heard you complete because it was genuine, it was real, you were passionate, and I think that's what people want. So in the moment, did you realize that you were kind of having an interesting night yourself? <laughs> it's funny you say, thanks, man. I appreciate the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Learning anything new, it takes time. And uh, maybe using the analogy of I've always had kind of training wheels on. Adam, you've been in the booth with me. There's notes everywhere and you want to get so much out. And, and maybe kind of the training wheels came off that night and, and I found out kind of who I was as a broadcaster and, and it, everything came from the heart and, and, and all of my experiences as a player, as a coach, as a passionate Canadian kind of maybe came out in that broadcast and maybe kind of came out in that laugh when that second goal came in, which was, which was cool. Well, that was the laugh of, uh, when the second goal was scored, but it was also just like well, probably my favorite moment was was when Davies burned, I think, Tim Ream, and, and you let out like kind of a little squeal there. Um, that that kind of thing and the way you kind of approach um, the job, have, have you kind of thought much about that and, and what kind of uh, personality you want to be on there? Uh, I have now. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's it's more of a... You know, Tara, I think it was everything you did before was was a little bit more traditional, right? I think that was the the night where you kind of broke outside that a little bit and and dared to be a little bit different, and it ended up working really well. I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when I first started, I, I listened to Christian Jack talk on on, on TSN, and uh, I, I mentor kind of him, DeVos, and, and Luke, and and they're so articulate and 
British like you, Ollie, and <laughs> they structure their sentences perfectly. There's, there's, there, and I kind of was like, right, I've, I've got to be that guy. This is what a soccer broadcaster looks like at, at the top of their game in Canada, and tried to emulate KJ a little bit, and, and maybe got lost and lost some time there. Uh, but, but I, I think two things: uh, be yourself, and and just love living in the moment. Kind of going full circle to what you said, Kurt. Right. And I think feedback's good too. You, you don't get a ton in this industry. And uh, everyone, once a broadcast is done, people are gone. And this is one of the things I love about working for One Soccer is, is we're always analyzing ourselves and, and listening to feedback from the viewers. And I know Ollie, Kurt, you, Adam, you're, you're, you're working on, like, how, how can we get better? How can we take it to the next level? How can we give the viewers what we want? And uh, I, I think that that's important. Um, so yeah, any feedbacks much appreciated and, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to work on that. Hopefully there's some world cup qualifiers coming up so we can get you back in there. It, it's <laughs> funny you mentioned the feedback because it's typically either people I've always sort of told myself that if you ever get someone on social media who are like, Oh, that was a terrible broadcast. The people that enjoyed it or had nothing bad to say, aren't going, that was a, that was an okay broadcast, like decent job. You're either getting like the your friends and family going, oh, you crushed it today. Or the people who really didn't like it will tell you. But then there's all those viewers in between because you are a part of the broadcast, but you're not the broadcast. It's still about the players. So I'm with you on the feedback point. Well said. Okay. Yeah, You just need to put your ego to the side. And it's not about us. It's, it's just telling a, a great story to the viewers. And, and to be fair, our product speaks for itself. The CPL is awesome. Canada's flying right now. The women have been crushing it for years. Uh, we're really lucky and I, I can't wait to get my hands on some of the Mexican stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, let's um, don't want to take away from what's been a very sort of uplifting and, and motivational um, conversation about the growth of being a commentator and the growth of Canadian football. But we were talking about the satisfaction from that TFC Whitecaps game. I want to ask you on the other side of that token, you can still live and not have regrets, but I'm wondering if there was a match that if you could change the outcome of one match, what would you change and why? I think you guys probably know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> against Honduras. Uh, I was sat on the bench for that. I didn't play, but uh, that, that was a tough moment. We put so much in that campaign. Everybody was in the peak of their career. Uh, th that was a tough one to swallow and uh, kind of just, I'll never forget the moment looking around the airport coming back and we were, we were soulless. We were just all walking around like zombies. No, no one knew where to go next. It, it took time to get over it, but, but that was a tough one. Uh, I think since injury and up until my debut, there's nothing else I could have done, uh, which is nice. I, I can sleep well at night. Mm. I, uh, I actually wrote down the exact same result. I just wrote down eight one here with an underline to remind myself uh because i really liked that team uh i really liked uh uh stephen hart i think everybody has time for stephen hart uh i thought you guys played really 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 well at home during that world cup qualifying cycle and the way you guys played at home i thought indicated that if you could get over that hump that one last game in honduras that you guys had a chance to finish in a third or fourth spot in the hex just given i thought you guys could beat just about anybody at BMO field. Yeah. And, uh, to go down there and, uh, it was disappointing, right? Cause not only is, is, is Canada, you know, eliminated, but it was also one of the last, you know, more recent chances where Canada had to, you know, to go up and, and, and take another step in the minds of your average everyday viewer in Canada as well. So it was a missed opportunity. I also didn't get the chance to cover what another, uh, 10 hexagonal games, which would have been a great experience. So I'm going to go with day one as well. It was, Kurt, it, I think you nailed it. It was a watershed moment. It might have been a turning point. Uh, and we we're getting close to that again. And the, the U.S. win was a big one. Uh, and, and it was tough. And guys, by the way, your content's been incredible. I've, I've loved watching it. Uh, if, you, if you really want some great insight to it, Ian Hume spoke really well about it. And, and he goes into detail of what it was like to be in camp what it was like those 90 minutes. Uh, I, I think he nails nails it really well. Yeah, in, in terms of Canadian soccer, I just want to throw TFC in the Champions League final in there as well in terms of an outcome I'd like to change. Um, like I covered TFC, I wouldn't consider myself a fan, but that 
that felt like kind of a bigger moment for Canadian soccer as a whole to have a team potentially go to the Club World Cup and to for a Canadian team rather than an American team to win the Champions League um, and take it off the Mexicans for the first time would have just been... thought they deserved it too. It, yeah, it, it, yeah. it is. You talk about a team that's never, you know, an MLS team's never played like that in a CONCACAF Champions League tournament. They've never gone on the road in three different environments like that and played so well. So that was that was disappointing, you're right. And to play like that with all the players that they were missing as well. Like the, the lineup by the end of the Champions League final was incredible, uh, you know, for them to even be in that tie. So, yeah, that, that was one that... Um, Give Agar like, Akeche some love. Akeche, yeah. No, I'd say, Ollie, which is kind of cool, like trying to bring a positive light to that. You know, I'm super optimistic is uh, I, I think what TFC did, not only for Canadian teams, but also MLS, I thought they were flying the flag for, for, for both the U.S. and Canada is that it's possible. It's doable. We can go beat these American teams. And, and we did it with a ju- jury rigged team. The entire squad was needed. Uh, so, so it's there for us. It's possible. And that's what I take away from that campaign. Uh, so it was uh, it was pretty cool to see the entire kind of league, country, city unite uh, against the Mexicans. And and like to go through what the different types of Mexican teams as well was was pretty special. That all the big dogs with different styles of play. It was uh, the roadmap to get to where TFs to that shootout was tough. It's yeah. a long, this is a long standing debate that Oliver Platt and I have had about that night uh, in, uh, in Guadalajara. Uh, first of all, shout out to Marky Delgado, Platt's guy, for, uh, for agreeing to stop after the game and talk to me about his miss and to, to, to give me a few minutes, even though he was actually in tears. And, and I thought that was really brave of Marky Delgado, and that's why I have a lot of respect for him today. But Terry Dunfield, should Marky Delgado have done better with that chance? Oliver Platt says no. I say yes. Uh. <laughs> all, all I'm saying, I'm not necessarily saying he couldn't have done better. What I'm saying is, is that there were, I think, two defenders plus the goalkeeper in the path of the ball to the goal. There was not a lot of goal to shoot at. And I think he gets too much criticism for that miss, for the quality of chance that it actually was. I think it's tougher when you bring in the context that it late in the game, it's the end of a campaign. He's just run whatever it was, 50 yards to get on the end of it. Uh, It's the 90 odd minutes. Uh, So so I think as a coach, I think you bring those factors into it. And and then don't forget he was early twenties. He's a different player now as well. And, and, and I think the more times you experience and hopefully you'll get another chance to scratch that itch, uh, be in those scenarios uh, and, and you can't replicate that in training. I, I think you need experience and if it comes to him now, 100%, I think he takes it. Here, we're running out of time with you, but I want to make sure that we get to, we want to complete the Terry Dunfield character story arc before we say goodbye. So I just want to ask you quickly about the transition into coaching. Obviously, you mentioned being with the U14s. But more specifically, I'd love to hear a reflection in general from you, but I, I want to ask when you make that transition, are you in the mindset of, I want to do all the things that I've learned as a player and do that as a coach, or are you more like working with the team, your surroundings and building your, clo- your coaching philosophy that way? It's funny. That was my first thought uh, is to share my experiences and this will be easy. I'll just go in and teach what I knew as a player and, and, six months, I'm going to be Greg Vanny or John Herdman. No, that's not the case. Uh, It's completely different. And I mean, everything that you experience at a player, there'll be times you can use that. You need to push it to a side. And just like broadcasting, you're learning something completely new. And what you're doing is you're teaching and you're helping people. And uh, for you to best help, help these kids or whoever it might be is you need to really understand the why. And, uh, I'm lucky I get to do what I really love. And my academy director, when I first sort of stepped into the under 14 role, said to me, Terry, it's going to take you seven years to figure this out. And I was like, come on, man. And uh, like I'm at year four or five right now. And still every single day I'm learning something new. And uh, not to sound too like overly sentimental. I'm just really fortunate that TFC gave me the opportunity to, to develop as a coach and Hopefully I've been able to help some of the little dudes. 
It's totally Sorry. fine if you don't have an answer for this, but have you, have you given much thought to what would be the last thing in your career you want to achieve, whether it is coaching a certain team or at a certain level or continuing broadcast to a certain degree? What, what is left for you? Cause you've achieved a lot in your career already. I, I thanks man. Uh, I think, I'm still figuring myself out. I, I'd say in year one and two, I was like, I want to manage at the highest level in North America. And uh, I'd say in the last couple of years, when, when I've kind of taken a step back and, and learned from so, so, some top operators, I, I just want to help people. I want to help Canadian soccer and whatever that role might be for one soccer, TSN, TFC, Canada soccer. Uh, I just, however I can help best. And uh I, I think all of us are, are in this together and there's no secrets. Uh, if we're going to move this game forward in Canada, uh, we all have to get after it, keep pushing ourselves and, uh, and see where it takes ourselves. Terry, what have you learned about um, young Canadian players now you've been working with TFC and, and with the national team at the youth level as well? What, what do you think, summing up as much as you can, are the kind of strengths and weaknesses of the young Canadian player coming through today? Uh, I think if you go through the provinces, each player is just a little bit different. Uh, but what we do have is an incredible player pool. And, and if we can engage our kids and give them the tools that they need uh, to succeed, that there are some special players here. And, and I think the Alfonso Davies story is a real, there's a clear pathway now for kids. You don't need to move to Manchester at 14 where there's a million different variables and managers changes, new culture, no family around you. I think here uh, that there's, there's a clear pathway, whether it's going through academies, hopefully that start up soon in the CPL, whether it's going through MLS academies or uh, province programs or OPDL clubs, whatever it might be. Um, there's a way to, to building a career and uh, there's some fantastic people in the game. Um, but, but two things, incredible player pool. And what we have now is, is a clear pathway for Canadian kids to, to become professional players. Mm -hmm. All right, running out of time. Any last questions you want to get in with Dunfield? Oh, I think we uh, need to ask him about uh, Gareth Wheeler and his relationship to him and uh, <laughs> where that ranks all time. Yeah, he's, he's yeah is, he, is he a top 10 teammate? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. It's funny uh, when I first sort of came back to Canada five years ago. Uh, everyone's always a little bit skeptical, and, and we got to get rid of this per persona of like it's Game of Th Game of Thrones, and <laughs> like we're in this together, guys. But when I first came back, one 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 guy who put his arm around me and said, "You know what? I'll look after you. I'll show you the ropes." Was Gareth Wheeler, and uh, not only are we commentating partners uh but we're we're really good friends uh away from work and uh he's, he's a mentor as crazy as that might sound <laughs> just oh you were gonna say paul i thought you were gonna say paul mariner <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was my mate as well but wheels is uh he he's uh he just has so much energy and passion and uh he's experienced so much in the game and uh i learn from him every day yeah I echo that a thousand percent. Um, playing teammates, who's the favorite teammate you've ever had? What could be because of the ability or just because of who they were as a person? Uh, I, I mentioned him at the start. Uh, he was an Israeli international, a player called Ayo Berkovich. Uh, if, if you guys don't know or viewers don't know who he is, uh, check him out. This guy was, was just so silky. He was so smooth. Hmm. Sorry, the correct answer there was was Oscar Lopez, CEO of uh, Media Pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, Oscar, right, that's it. He's a good player. He is. He certainly <laughs> is. It's hard to believe it's been an hour. Um, that's going to wrap up another hangout for us today. Tomorrow, hangouts are back tonight. Though one soccer happy hour at a different time, nine p.m. Eastern. Andy, Laura, and Carm have Melissa Tancredi on the program. And then tomorrow inside the game with the aforementioned Gareth Wheeler will subscribe to us on YouTube if you haven't. All of those little things make a huge difference for us. Thank you so much for tuning in. Terry, we love you. We miss you. Thanks so much for spending an hour with us. We know it's been a busy day for you. And all the best to you, Afton, and the entire family. Thanks, man. Keep up the good work, guys. Keep pushing.
Cheers, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Thanks for watching.